Hi, this is Little Dwarf playing games while rambling incoherently into a microphone. Why? Well, just because I can. And I continue with Strangeland with the developer's commentary. That's a lot of buttons. said they did something to you. Who are they? I don't know. I, I can't remember. There was metal and lights, and there were men speaking. Their voices are cold and distant. I don't understand the words. And then they're hurting me. And I hear them say, this will help. The stream mate is remembering or articulating the stranger's projection. Brain sense surgery meant to deal with the woman's tumor is mediated through the carnival setting, however. She is described whatever procedures Rota, Atri and Alberich inflicted on her. People like that sign their handiwork. If you want their names, I'm sure you can find them. Do you know anything about the dark thing? They took my sight. For me, everything is dark. There was a golden-haired woman. I was a woman once. But I'm trying to help another woman. They said they were helping me. But now I'm gone. Maybe she's gone too. You said that there's something in your mind that isn't memories. What did you mean? I don't know. I don't understand. It's like someone carved his thoughts into my mind. Carved what thoughts? I know about metal. This The suggestion is that Rota, Atri and Alberich gave, gave her their metalworking metal knowledge when they made her. I know how to make it bend to my will, how to fill it with my own pain, until it has the power to hurt, to cut, to kill. I need a weapon to kill the dark thing. Of course you do. What did you have in mind? Can't you just make me a weapon? Bring me what it is you want. Goodbye. I was about seven years old, the father of a friend of my brother's, a friend of the family who had been uh, the assistant coach on our Little League team for years, got leukemia. And it was just a series of unfolding nightmares, one after another. So the first thing that I remember is that he had to try to find marrow donors. Um, because the chemotherapy that he was undergoing was going to kill all of his bone marrow. And so our school did a survey to try to get people to donate marrow. And I remember learning from my parents uh, what bone marrow donation entailed, that uh, they would have to break through your bone and suck the marrow out. And 
even right there, I remember having just this visceral terror of a disease so awful that to even begin a course of treatment uh, would require uh, a marrow harvesting um, that seemed that unnatural. Uh, and things got worse from there. Um, the chemotherapy caused this poor man to have a stroke. The stroke left him uh, unable to speak fully properly, unable to eat fully properly. And the, the stress of all of this, um, I think, took a toll on his personality and the combination of all of this took a toll on his marriage. Uh, and his, he and his wife divorced while he was in the process of recovering, uh, which itself was nightmarish at that time, uh, though divorces weren't unheard of. Um, they were still, they still had sort of a taboo quality to them, at least to a seven-year-old. Um, and, you know, the idea that this um, theretofore very stable uh, Little League family uh, that we were friends with, we'd had dinner at their houses, we'd seen the love in that family, um, that not only had this, um, you know, once invincible adult man, uh, father, coach, been physically broken by the disease, but um, this stable family unit had been broken by the disease, uh, or really the treatment of the disease. And um, while this was going on, my parents decided that my brother and I should go out with him to visit this man, which uh, was right. I mean, we should. Um, but, you know, children, at least when I was a child, I was so selfish and self-absorbed um, that I didn't want to go visit him. I remember rationalizing with him that, you know, he was really the father of a friend of my brother's. Why should I have to go? Um, but we went, and, you know, he was in a recovery facility, and I remember the, the smell. Um, and then we went into his room, and the sight of him was uh, just horrifying you know because of the the chemotherapy he had lost all of his hair including his eyebrows and he hadn't been in the sun for a long time and the you know a face a pale face without eyebrows just looks like a slab of beef tallow and we were there for a lunch and he couldn't really speak. You could understand him, but it wasn't the voice of the man uh, who'd been my coach. And it was difficult for him to eat. And I just remember, uh, you know, a sense of revulsion, a complete lack of empathy. I'm still ashamed of it today um, for his suffering, that I was focused only on my suffering at seeing his suffering. And being left, you know, after we went out um, with the sense of the precariousness of life um, and the, the horrors um, that seemingly at random, um, you know, there was no moral reason, there was no even logical reason why he should have developed leukemia. Um, and I had known from our discussions at school that this was a disease that could afflict children as well. Uh, and so there was just this sense that there, waiting inside everyone, um, was this terrible disease that could spring up at any time. It could bring down any person. It could destroy any family and just leave you still there, but as, a, you know, uh, nightmare version of yourself, trapped in yourself. And so um, in Strangeland, the Fiji mermaid is meant to capture uh, the widower's horror at seeing his wife 
undergo that kind of treatment for her cancer. Um, it's, you know, the sense of seeing someone you love, someone who in your mind's eye will be always beautiful in this halo of beauty. And then you see them in the flesh and the doctors and the treatments and the disease have made a monster out of them. Um, and the sense of guilt and helplessness that you feel by looking at that. Okay. The grapple's hooked onto something down there. Okay, that doesn't. They must be growing down from the U. It's like something's trying to get out. Now, the design of the, the dock thing was uh, was something I had a lot of fun with. I, I'm, I mean, I did all the quote-unquote animation for Strange Land. Um, I don't really consider myself an animator. It's certainly nothing. It's certainly not something I studied or even tried to attempt before getting into kind of um, video game production and, and forming uh, Wormwood Studios and, and so forth. Um, but I, I generally prefer kind of environmental style out animations. Um, things like lightning strikes, uh, rain hitting things, uh, lighting effects. That, that stuff I really enjoy. Explosions. Um, ha making uh, bipedal human beings walk around realistically, I find a lot less fun. Although I feel like, you know, if pressed, I can do that. Um, but the dark thing was, was where I had quite a lot of fun designing it. Um, I don't think it's the most genius brilliant uh, even really good design but uh i do i do like what i what i did with it i mean i i modeled the modeled the look of, and the, the feel of how it moved around off a uh, ferro fluid which is uh, a fluid packed with magnetic particles that can then be uh, manipulated using magnetics um it's a uh, it's pretty interesting stuff ferro fluid so uh, the, the look of the look of the creature pretty much comes from that and also the other big influence um i don't know if anyone out there would pick up on this but um the old uh itc television show starring patrick mcgoon called the prisoner which uh i think i believe this a lot of you might be familiar with the the simpsons um doing a take off it where the simpsons family gets gassed and drugged constantly it's basically a this this great old spy show about a, a spy that was um kind of kidnapped on an island and he's uh every episode is just about him being pressed for information information um gotta check it out if you haven't heard it anyway there's a there's a thing in the park that um a thing in the on the island in the prisoner that, that keeps all the prisoners in line and it's called the rover um originally for the show it was supposed to be like a, a johnny five robot uh, that would just rove around the island like electrocute people with um servo arms and stuff which sounds as terrible as I'm sure it would have looked um, at the time it, when it was produced in the 70s, one of the first television color, color television shows. So anyway, they, they, they dropped the idea of the robot when they couldn't get it to work and just used a giant white weather balloon and filmed it in such a way that it just looked like a floating white sphere that would bounce down the beach after the prisoners and then envelop them when they scream and there'd be this like shrieking uh, tape echo, kind of BBC tape echo effect. Uh, freaking love that show and i freaking love the rover so i kind of <laughs> if, if there is any plagiarism in strange line from my end it's uh it's me ripping off the rover um inverting its colors and giving it a ferro fluid look for our dark thing but i still kind of like that shout out because god i love that show when i was seven uh the so-called brood 10 of 17-year cicadas hatched in Washington, D.C., and literally billions of cicadas crawled out of the ground, crawled onto trees, shed their nymphal skins, emerged as imagos, and took to the air. It's 
almost impossible to describe what it was like uh, if you haven't lived through it. You were actually being hit with cicadas, which don't fly very well, on a regular basis on the schoolyard. Um, you would be pelted by them in their frantic dash to find mates. When you walked, uh, there were so many dead cicadas on the ground that your feet would crunch. Uh, you could find their shells all over the surfaces of trees. Sometimes you could actually see the ground churning where they were emerging. And I should say cicadas are extremely uh, scary looking insects. They're harmless, um, but to a kid there is nothing cooler than this clawed, many-eyed monster crawling out of the ground, uh, bursting from its skin, taking to the air. Um, it was just a tremendous experience, unforgettable. Um, and you know, one of my uh, particular memories of it was a friend of mine and I found a newly emerged imago that was white, uh, its wings and uh, carapace hadn't hardened yet. And you know, we, we pulled it off the tree, which we probably shouldn't have done, and just held it in my hand um, and watched as it eventually hardened and could fly. And it was really like watching magic in front of you. You know, Ovid, when he wanted to write poems about the magic of the gods, it was the, the collection is the one we call Metamorphoses, and there's really no metamorphosis um, as easy to observe as that from a cicada nymph to a cicada imago. It's not like a caterpillar to a butterfly um, because it happens so quickly by comparison. Um, it's really remarkable. And in preparing to record this commentary, I looked up some of the news articles from my childhood from the New York Times and Washington Post because I wanted to fact check my recollection to see if it was really as amazing an event as I had recalled. And the answer is yes. Um, this occurrence filled all of the major U.S. newspapers with article after article, and the articles are completely ridiculous. Um, so just to give a sample of one from near the end of the cicada's emergence in Washington, D.C., the Washington Post reports, quote, just when the noise of the cicadas, their odor, and their constant surprise attacks are making their weeks above ground seem as long as their 17 years in hibernation, some Washingtonians have found a way to enjoy them before they vanish. They are eating them. Now, I do not know anyone, even among children who I know eat insects because I saw them do it, whoever ate a cicada, but I suppose in those mad days anything is possible. Um, the New York Times provides this description of the metamorphosis, and I thought that's where I would end. Quote, with crab-like claws for front legs, the nymphs will climb into a tree and, holding tight to the bark, wriggle out of their skin for the fifth and last time to emerge as adults, nearly two inches long, and eerily white with striking red eyes. The nymphal skins, which look like transparent peanut shells, may remain on the trees or fall to the ground. Within hours of shedding the last nymphal skin, the newly formed cicadas darken and their red-veined wings expand. A distinct black mark in the shape of a W will also appear near the outer edge of the front wings which prompted the superstitious belief that cicadas foretold war. Okay, that, that, that sounds quite nightmarish, uh, what he described, you know, uh, hundreds or thousands of cicadas 
uh, everywhere. It's pretty horrible. out. A cicada, maybe even ready to fly. Shall we? There's something golden in there. It reminds me of her. It's falling off the end of the world. Someone's sobbing inside there, but I can't see anything. The characters in Strangeland, as I've mentioned in another commentary track, are manifestations of the thoughts, the imagination, the memory, um, the hopes of a widower uh, who's working through the grief of his wife's death. And each of these characters represents a different kind of failed coping strategy to deal with some tragedy or disappointment or shame that the widower experienced over the course of his life. So you have uh, the clown who has gallows humor um, to avoid struggling with actual tragedy. Um, you have Rota hiding in the darkness um, and refusing to think about uh, the things that he gave up um, in go growing from a boy into a man. Um, you have the scribe uh, who uses literature um, to separate himself from his memories and his feelings while trying to forget his own experiences. And, you know, the, I could go through all of them. 8-3 is someone who's sort of become a salary man and lost himself in his work and dehumanized himself through work. And so in that sense, even though each of them is a distinct character with a distinctive voice, um, his own goals, and within the uh, make-believe of the carnival, actually has backstory um, and, you know, experiences of, that belong to that character, really the better way to think of them are ways in which the widower is disgusted by his own inability to cope with tragedy. And the stranger uh, is, in a sense, the last of these efforts to cope with, with tragedy and with the greatest of the tragedies, which is the loss of his wife. And the game really is that coping process. Someone's sobbing inside there, but I can't see anything. Why must you shine a light on Rota? The Norse word for rat, and also an anagram for otar, typically otr, the boy shape changer inadvertently slain by Loki in the story Otter's Ransom. As further notes will explain, Rota's story references the myth, myth repeatedly. Rota is also a f homophone for Rota, an arrangement of letters on the tarot deck a card, the Wheel of Fortune. Rota's appearance is inspired by the famous P.T. Barnum's circus 
Sideshow Attraction, Fedor Adrianovich uh, Yevtichev, also known as Yo-Yo or Dog-Faced Boy. In the darkness, I can't see or be seen. That is always better. There was a golden-haired woman who threw herself down this well. Oh, yes. I've watched her body break upon the roots many times. Shame on the man who cannot keep such a lovely thing. Who are you? Outside Rota, locked inside a cage. Husk Rota, hollow Rota, keen and clever Rota. T.S. Eliot's poem The Hollow Man is alluded to throughout Strangeland and the two works uh, share similar themes and imagery. Like Strangeland, the poem is about the dead souls, whether literally dead or merely deadened, confronting their doubts, uncertainty and guilt about whether they have realized their hopes and ideas or merely surrounded their lives, squandered their lives. The suggestion is strongly the latter. The poem is rich with religious and literary allusions. Among the images directly relevant to Rota specifically would be the verses We are the hollow men, we are the stuffed men, our dried voices are quiet and meaningless as, a rat, as rats feed over broken glass. More generally, the poem repeatedly references eyes, stars, the shadow, the land of the dead and other symbols that appear throughout the game. The poem is probably more famous for its, for, its, for its conclusion, which is not thematically connected to Strangeland. This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. For edges and craft are all they left of me. All who left of you? Who put you here? When they killed my boy inside Rota, they hollowed him out and locked me in for a boy's life and a man's freedom. Mm, boy's Life magazine, published since 1911 by the Boy Scouts of America, extolling a perhaps naive spirit of adventure, freedom and general joy de vivre. I took their blood silver and worldly wisdom and built this cage myself with what they gave me. In the myth of Otter's ransom after Loki kills the boy Otter, Loki, uh, Loki, Odin and Honir are forced to pay the Vergild blood money to his father, specifically enough gold to fill the pelt of the otter in whose form the boy died, as well as enough gold to cover it. The greed of this Vergild demand ultimately dooms Otter's father and family to misery as set forth in the Nibelugilid, a reference throughout Strangeland. Here the stranger has already found a rat skin stuffed with silver, which Rota later identifies as his boy. You of all people should know that we plan our prisons with our own minds and shape our shackles with our own hands. Who is inside Rota? The one they killed? No one is inside Rota now. The boy is gone. Rota's ransom is different from Otter's ransom. Inside Rota is not Rota's son, but ra rather Rota's boyhood joys, which he bargained away for money. Like the myth, Rota is a cautionary, ta cautionary tale about the danger of treating joy and money as commensurable. He's been hollowed out and stuffed with money. Do you know anything about the dark thing? Where it came from, how it can defeat it, anything? I offer only this advice. Sit sobbing in the shadows, alone and empty, or else never look back and never look in. In those two ways, a haunted, hunted man can hide from such horror. I don't want to hide. I want to destroy it. Then I can't help you. No man can. Like the prophecy in the Lord of the Ring, uh, rings that not by the hand of the man could the witch king be slain, uh, itself likely taken from the weird sister's prophecy in Macbeth, Rota's statement here is deliberately under-inclusive. The stream mate provides the help that no man can offer. What is this place? 
You rode a bug to where madness is rooted in myth amid the void. Do you think there's an atlas for such places? I'll tell you this. A carnival is where flesh rises. Rota is invo invoking the word's etymology, which, uh, which is literally rising flesh. The grave is where flesh sinks. And here we hang in between. Who are they? They are we. Since I've grown and shrunken into one of them, we are machine men who take and make what we will. In The Great Dictator, Charlie Chaplin gives a rousing humanist speech in which he implores, don't give yourself to these unnatural men, machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machine, you are not cattle, you are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate. In the same speech he warns, more than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Clever and keen Rota uses the pejorative against himself more out of self-loathing than self-aggrandizement. My cousin Atri has gone the farthest. A might of a man in a metal box. Rota is suggesting that Atri is merely posing as a living furnace, in the same fashion that the famous chess-playing mechanical Turk of the 18th century was in reality a machine operated from within by a hidden person. What? That seems very cool and interesting. I must. I will probably read more about it because if I understand this correctly, in the 18th century they pretended to have invented a robot, basically that was playing chess, but it was actually a person. You know him. You know, steering You've known it. Us all, and you'll hate us helplessly. Did you mean eight three? He thinks his reckoning will be easier as a number. If you're Rhoda and 8-3 is Atri, then who's Alberic? As noted, Alberic is the central antagonist of Wagner's Ring Cycle, a dwarf who covets both the Rhine Maidens and their gold. Oh, indeed. Are you suggesting that I'm Alberic? Stranger. A man who asks another, who am I, will never gain himself an answer. He will only lose, for I can carve from you an Alberic, but never an Adam. Rota elsewhere describes the stream maid, and perhaps by the extension, the woman, as Nynaeve, or no Eve. You cease to be in God's image the day you cannot say, I am who I am. Rota alludes to the fact that God created man in his own image, and that God, when asked to identify himself by Moses, answers only I am who I am, often as that I am or what I am. Uh, Rota's implication is that the stranger's desire to identify himself with a name rather than through self-awareness will constrict and diminish him. Uh, compare the varieties of religious experience, truth and fact well up into our lives in ways that exceed verb verbal formulations. Is that a yes? No, you fool. It's a warning. Rhoda, did you have something to do with that mermaid? Stream maid in the mysteries of the deep? I saw your name on the plaque beneath her. Indeed. We machine men found a nymph and made of her an imago. A nymph is a larval state of an insect, while an imago is at its mature state. To reach Rota, the stranger had to aid the cicada in its metamorphosis from a nymph to an imago, but a nymph can also describe a beautiful young woman associated with nature, whereas an imago in psychoanalysis can mean the static, mentally fixed image of a loved one. Rota is invoking both senses here and is associating what they did to the stream maid with what the stranger did to the woman, holding onto her only as a mental image. With all our skill, we cut and cooked and cured, leaving little of her beyond our handicraft. And when men shrink from the sight of such devastation, that dumbstruck dread pays us homage. Rota is alluding to God's prophecy of the Nineveh's destruction from the Book of Naum. 
I will pelt you with filth, I will treat you with contempt, and I will make you a spectacle. All who see you will free from, flee from you and say, Nineveh is in ruins, who will mourn for her? Where can I find anyone to comfort you? Uh, Rota later tells the stranger that the streammate's name is Nineveh. How can you be proud of creating something so miserable? We both know the thrills of self-loathing are no less than those of self-love. A darkness at noon, he had believed that he had drunk the cup of humiliation to the dregs. Now he was to find out that powerlessness had as many grades as power, that defeat could become as vertiginous as victory, and that its depths were bottomless. And is it not agreed that misery loves company? Goodbye. Yes, it will be good when you are gone. Hmm, but wait. Sh shouldn't he Here tell me... Again. Shouldn't he tell me her name? I guess may maybe she hasn't told me that I need it. Can't you just make me a weapon? Bring me what it is you want. Goodbye. My dagger. Can you make it sharper? Stronger? Oh, yes. As sharp as tragedy. As strong as despair. But when a woman from the water gives you a blade, she always begs a boon. This is a reference to the Lady of the Lake of the Arthurian legend, who furnishes Arthur with Excalibur in exchange for a boon. This promise is ultimately one King Arthur cannot bring himself to fulfill, the head of Sir Balin. Here the, the price is more modest, uh, though there are ample heads in Strangeland that th that stranger could have brought her. Are you ready to pay the price? Actually, what was the price in the end? Yes? My name. I want my name. Then my pain will hone you an edge that will cut right to the heart. Is the cost just finding out her name? Because that seems pointless because it's not a personal cost. It doesn't actually cost the protagonist anything to do it. What is the mermaid's name? We took that and kept it for ourselves. It has a value. It has a price. And we give nothing away for free. Least of all what we have stolen. Tell me her name. When I am paid. Tell me her name. When I am paid. Goodbye. Hmm. What did I pay him with? Originally, I don't remember. My boy was heaped with such silver when they took him. In in the Norse myth of Otter's Ransom, the slain child is both stuffed with and covered in gold. I have no need of any more. Inside Rota, stuffed with money, huh? I wonder. <laughs> so little left of my boy. A loss for a loss will square our accounts. And so, I name her Nynaeve. Nynaeve. Nine Eve, dubious German for no Eve. In Genesis, the creation of Eve, Eve stems from God's observation that it is not good for the man to be alone. While the canonical accounts of Eve's life are limited, various ap apocryphal works indicate that she slightly outlived Adam, remaining his companion for all of the 930 years and asking God to bury him, to bury her alongside him. For example, the life of Adam and Eve. Lord, Master, God of all virtue, do not estrange me from the body of Adam. Rota might be associating the stream mate with the woman, 
and suggesting that, like, unlike Eve, she was denied, denied the chance to remain with the stranger for all his days, or that unlike Eve, she cannot be faulted in any respect for her fault. Uh, alternatively, he may be noting the difference between the stream made, created or deformed by Rota, Edri and Alberich from a woman, and Eve, created by God from Adam's rib, uh, Nynaeve. One of the names for the Lady of the Lake in Arthurian mythology, alternatively Nimue, who bestows the sword Excalibur on King Arthur, the stream maid previously invoked the same comparison. Nineveh. Mm, some Old Testament works, which Rota is referencing, describe the utter destruction of the great Assyrian city of Nineveh. Uh, Nineveh is a pool whose water is draining away, stop they cry, but no one turns back, and it shall come to pass that all that, uh, that, all, they that, that all they that look upon thee shall free flee from thee, and say, Nineveh is laid with waste, who will bemoan her, whence shall I seek comforters for thee? According to the book of Jonah, in contrast, the city is spared after Ninevites repent, Rota's invocation of the noun prophecy uh, is more apt. Uh, he, Atri, and Albrich have made an utter ruin of the stream made. A specific prophecy of a pool whose water is draining away foreshadows the puzzle the stranger will later encounter. Yes, Nineveh. Okay, I'm dead. <laughs> I guess not quite. Throughout the first two acts of the game, primarily during Act 2, the player is able to get glimpses of another version of the realm he finds himself in, essentially Deadland, which he visits in Act 3, by using the torch on the dead NPCs and gathering their souls to solve the Corsair puzzle. The idea to set up crows and have one pixel dust particle slowly moving around has been something that predates any commercial project I've been a part of. It's a visual representation I find myself to be very fascinated by. It almost feels like applying slow motion to a scene. I think the crows give that creepy undertone and the dust particles provide that serenity and numbness of death looming or being ever present. <laughs> Nineveh. Your name is Nineveh. In Primordia, when Horatio first learns his true name, he delivers a, a very similar pair of lines. Horus, my name is Horus. Yes! Show me 
me the blade, while the pain of my name is still sharp. As sharp as tragedy, huh? Let's see what it can cut. Thank you. It's like she's burnt out. Leave me. I think there are some people who have such powerful imaginations and such creative genius that they're able to really create something radically new or different, um, a leap away from what has been done before rather than just an incremental step. I don't have that capacity to the extent I have any creative ability. It's a creative ability that depends upon taking the pieces that others have made and reassembling them in some somewhat different way, or taking uh, one set of pieces and putting them into a frame that exists somewhere else. This, to me, uh, is itself sort of an interesting process, because it's also the way that I learn about the world. So when I set out to make Fallen Gods, um, a role-playing game that I'm working on right now, I spent a couple of years just reading all of the Icelandic sagas, all of the Scandinavian folklore, um, the primary accounts of Viking history, secondary accounts of Viking history, um, Norse mythology in its original or as close to original form as we have, and in modern retellings, um, fiction inspired by that era. And the reason why is because you really have to spread out all of those pieces. I have to spread out all of those pieces before I can start putting them together in some way and know what the pieces are that are out there. And when you do that, um, I think you start to recognize that you're not the only one working with those pieces. Um, when you read the list of dwarf names in the Edda, you discover that all of the dwarfs and even Gandalf in The Hobbit have their names taken from that litany of dwarf names. Um, and there's just sort of an interesting flash of recognition to the other people who have worked with these pieces. With, But I did still take the same approach. And for me, the major sources of material for the game, there is the sort of literal environment of the carnival, the circus, um, and there's a symbolic level of mythology uh, and faith, and then there's a psychological layer um, of depression and grief and despair. There's the biological medical layer of cancer, and working with those and weaving them together was a very satisfying process for me. And I think the character of Nineveh, the mermaid, is a good example of this. So with her, um, we we're trying to really capture the agony, uh, dehumanization, the sense of your body being taken from you um, that radical cancer treatment entails whether it's the radical surgeries of the past, whether it's heavy chemotherapy, you know, reading accounts of people who have gone through those processes um, it conveys a, a fairly consistent theme. Um, and so the image that I thought would be effective for this is the Fiji mermaid, um, which is sort of this monstrous chimera that P.T. Barnum apparently made or purchased by stitching together uh, a monkey carcass and a fish carcass. Um, and, you know, the idea um, of this form that ought to be a beautiful um, mermaid or a siren 
but is instead really repugnant and repulsive. Um, and then the name weaves together um, both the Nimue or uh, Nynaeve uh, character, uh, the Lady in the Lake from King Arthur, because she is this woman you meet in the water here. She bestows on you a blade. So of course we'd want to draw from that uh, mythological root there. And finally, um, the biblical reference to Nineveh, a city that had its destruction foretold. It turns out it was not actually destroyed by God, but the Old Testament describes the ruin that awaits Nineveh and the grief that its people will have and the unrequited nature of that grief um, that I thought would capture um, not just the sentiment of the patient, but also uh, the sadness of those looking upon someone they loved and seeing her suffer in that way. Um, so we, I think with all the characters in the game, there's that kind of weaving together of the different source material. Um, I don't think it, she's an original creation, but I think she is an original assembly of these different sources. And so perhaps in that sense, uh, the Fiji mermaid is particularly apt. Throughout Strangeland, we reference a variety of Norse myths, and one of the ones that is being referenced here is the myth concerning the goddess Sif and the loss of her hair. So the myth basically runs that as a prank, Loki shaved her head. She was the wife of Thor. Thor wakes up, finds his wife bald, uh, chases down Loki, demands that Loki find a solution. Loki goes to the dwarfs, the dwarfs uh, enter into a crafting competition uh, with one set of dwarfs, including uh, Atri, uh, make a set of items that include Mjolnir and the magical ship and a magical boar, and the other set of dwarfs make, uh, the sons of Ivaldi, make, among other things, uh, Sif's golden hair. And Sif then replaces her erstwhile blonde hair with real gold hair that grows just like real hair and is more lustrous and thick than ever. Um, so here you have literal golden hair that's found and of course the woman is bald because of the chemotherapy that she had to undergo for her cancer treatment. Um, symbolically the shaving of Sif's head. Um, I learned recently, at least one theory, 
is that part of what Loki was doing is that when a woman's head was shaved um, in German Norse society, uh, it was a sign that she had been caught as an adulteress and her husband had shaved her head in punishment and for public shaming purposes. And so part of what Loki is doing with this prank is sowing discord uh, in the marital relationship, creating a, a public impression that uh, Thor and Sif are in some fight, that Sif had cheated on Thor. Um, and I think we could say more generally that what Loki is trying to do is emasculate Thor. And wholly aside from the just sort of direct one-to-one -one parody of being able to analogize the loss of hair and chemotherapy to this mythological source. Um, I think there is also some of that theme of emasculation here too. In, you know, in the English language, we have a single word, impotence, that means both male sexual dysfunction and powerlessness um, and you know i think with the stranger um, this sense of being unable to do um, the work of a heroic male fantasy that he imagined that somehow he should be able to save his wife from this terrible disease and in the end he's not able to do anything to help her that this is a kind of impotence and the Thor, Loki, Sif illusion um, reinforces that theme though in a fairly subtle way. not that easily. The Gordian Knot, also re referenced in Primordia, was a legendarily hard puzzle presented to Alexander the Great. Rather than attempting to untie the knot, he simply cuts through it, as the stranger cut through the knot of roots using his dagger. All you're doing is raveling and unraveling the same sorry thread that's guided you through the maze of a miserable life. In another Greek myth, uh, Thesa, uh, Theseus navigated his way in and out of the labyrinth where he had to kill the Minotaur by using a ball of thread given to him by King Minos' daughter Ariadne who had fallen in love with him. As an aside, the English word clue is derived from this famous ball of thread called a clue in Middle English. Uh, Theseus later betr betrayed Ariadne Aban abandoning her on the Isle of Naxos, where in some myths she hanged herself. How many times do you need to be told? This ends at the top of the park. Bye. Goodbye. You have said so before. I have nothing to say to it. Okay, I feel like this episode has been long enough, so I'm going to save. And end it for now. That's all for this one, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.